standing ovations before you talk. Um, yeah, the bar's up here right now. That's, uh, sorry, I'm not going to reach it. I apologize. Um, I'm not going to limbo for you on stage. Um, I apologize. I'm probably not going to do the worm either. Um, but uh, please enjoy your dinner. I, I do know there's dessert out there, so please feel free. I'm a teacher. I'm used to interruptions. Get up and go get dessert. Don't worry about that. So I am the 2013 National Teacher of the Year. Uh, I have been out and around uh, traveling a little bit uh, this year. Uh, I was telling Jay, sharing with Jason last night, uh, my Alaska Airlines account has 191,000 frequent flyer miles on it since June 1st. Um, I've got another 40,000 or so on United Airlines. Uh, so that pretty much means that I've been doing nothing and sitting in chairs uh, a lot uh, this last year. Uh, it's, a, it's amazing how sitting down will make you tired. You know, it, it is true though, when, uh, when I went to, to Scottsdale and, and met Amy and, and all the other state teachers of the year, one of the first questions teachers always ask themselves is, of course, what do you teach? That's like the, the icebreaker, isn't it? I mean, you all, you all did that when you came in here, you sat down. Oh, so what do you teach? So what do you teach? So let's answer the question briefly, shall we? What do I teach? You know, that question is, is a fairly easy question, isn't it? We expect the answer to that to be something simple, something that shows up on a report card, like chemistry, physics, and engineering. And it's true, most of the time when I say this, people in the room groan. They go, oh great, we get to listen to a scientist for a while, this will be fun. But the honest answer to that is that you know that we all do something more than that, right? We always have to do a few more jobs. So Zilla High School is a huge, yeah, go for it. Better? <laughs> much better, much better. So Zilla High School is a, a huge, huge high school. We have about 400 students, grades 9, 12. Our, our, our community is large as well. We got a stoplight now. Um, we're about 2,500 people in the entire community. And so you know that small schools, there are a lot of jobs that have to go around. So it's true, I do a few things. So when you ask what do you teach, there is a small list. First, I'm a member of the Washington Student Achievement Council. Our state governor appointed me to that board uh, last April. It's equivalent to a state board of higher education. We oversee all of state-based need and a budget of roughly $375 million as we're granting uh, state-based need scholarships to students. I'm also the Zilla Education Association co-president. That's the union co-president. Why? Because I missed a meeting. <laughs> That's, that's pretty much how it works. The, the, the truth be told, I actually enjoy being an advocate for other teachers. I enjoy uh, really listening to them and giving them a voice and sharing that with other people. I am a class advisor for our school. Last year I was the freshman class advisor. This year I would have been the sophomore class advisor. When I go back I'll be the junior class advisor. You know what that means, don't you? Oh yeah, the chemistry teacher is going to plan prom. Yeah, that's going to be awesome, isn't it? chemistry teacher plans prom. It'll be great. I do also run a science club at our school, uh, nerd club as some people like to call it. Uh, we do have quite a few nerds in our school though. School of 400 students, we've got 70 dues paying attending members of science club. Why? We get to blow stuff up. It's fun. We actually do blow a few things up, sometimes on purpose, sometimes on accident. We do a, a, a program in our school called the Team America Rocketry Challenge where we launch rockets and I don't mean the little rockets, I mean rockets. Literally five and a half to six feet tall. Launch them to an altitude upwards of a mile. Separate into two sections, have to come down. There's a digital altimeter inside. We're talking nerd stuff here. Okay, it's big time. I do that robotics program thing, the Zilla Robot Challenge. You know, our school has tons of funding and way more money than we ever know what to do with. <laughs> Wait a minute, that was a dream I was having. That's right, that's right. Actually, our, our school, if you take all of the funding that we receive per kid and you rank us according to our state, there's 296 school districts in our state, rank them by the amount of money they get per kid, we're actually 10th on that list from the bottom. There are only nine school districts in our state that receive fewer numbers of dollars per kid than we do. So we don't have a whole lot of funds and I, can, I have the numbers to back it up, but that doesn't stop us. I went out with parents in our community and raised over $25,000 in our tiny little town to buy 100 robot kits, and now we send them out for free to any other school in the state. They get to borrow the robot kits for six to eight weeks. They come back. We have a robot challenge on our campus, and we see who the biggest nerds in the state are. It's amazing. Completely free to all schools, public, private, alternative homeschools, 4-H, FFA, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, whoever 
kids should have access to the technology that they need to become successful. So it's a small program I do. We also do a hiking and backpacking program. I started this in my fourth year of teaching. I take students to Yellowstone National Park in the Beartooth Mountains of Montana. We take them upwards of 26 miles away from the nearest road. It's one of the most amazing lessons you can ever do as a male high school instructor is to teach the females on the trip how to dig their own toilets. <laughs> Not an awkward conversation at all. It's awesome. <laughs> We do that program to show kids what it's like to be self-sufficient, what it's like to take care of yourself. You know, when you're 26 miles away from the nearest road and you get a blister on your little toe, there's a, not a helicopter gonna come and, and carry you out of there. You gotta figure it out. You also have to ration your food because you gotta survive for the next 10 days out in the woods. So we do that one. I'm also the assistant drama director at our school. I know that being a science teacher and a drama director goes hand in hand. You would kind of expect it, right? <laughs> I'm also the yearbook advisor at the school. Now that one does actually go hand in hand. I am a, b a believer in STEM education, but I do believe that it also needs to be changed to STEAM. I totally agree with that. Why? If you really look at a yearbook layout and compare that to an engineering schematic, they are the same. Absolutely the same. We are still worried about dimensioning. We are filling and rounding corners of pictures. We're still worried about form. It's the same content. It really is. I'm also an adjunct faculty member at Central Washington University, Eastern Washington University, and Yakima Valley Community College. So that every single course I teach counts for college credit. If you take every single science class from me, you're going to earn 24 college credits without leaving Zilla High School on our campus. And by the way, I accept all students grades 9 through 12, including those on IEPs. In fact, some of my students who are on IEPs, they, they tell me there's no way this kid can be in there. They say, there's no way this kid can be in your class. And I said, really? Try me. Give me a chance. Give me, give, me, give me the opportunity. Some of these kids just haven't been given the same skills that match their abilities over the course of their lives. You put some of these kids into an engineering class and they flourish because engineering is the combination of art and science at the same time. They've got to be given those opportunities. I'm also on Zill School District School and Improvement Teams. You love going to those meetings. I'm the former assistant baseball coach at our school. I was a varsity baseball coach for five years until uh, somebody came along named Andrew. He's my son. I uh, realized I need to spend a little bit of time at home every once in a while. And I'm also a national board certified teacher. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who cares? So what? <clears throat> None of that tells you how I am as a teacher. All that tells you is I can't say no to things. <laughs> All that tells you is that I'm really good at meetings. You know how many meetings I go to? Oh, meetings are fun. I love, you know, one of the best meetings is having a meeting to set up a time to have a meeting. That's the best one. And if, oh, if I could just have all the agendas out ahead of time for the entire year, because we know exactly what we're going to be doing next August right now, don't we? <laughs> meetings are good, aren't they? That slide was not what I teach. That's my resume. There is a difference. There is a huge difference between your resume and what you teach. There is a huge difference between your resume and what you are as a teacher leader. You don't have to have a laundry list of things to point to to be a teacher leader. It is very, very different than that. That is not the focus of my teaching. There's something else very, very important. So I ask the question again, what do I teach? It has nothing to do with subjects that show up on report cards. I do not teach chemistry, physics, and engineering. I'm not the robot teacher. People say, oh yeah, you're the robot guy. You teach robots. I haven't taught a robot a single day in my life. <laughs> you program robots. You teach kids. There's a difference. So what do I teach? I teach people. I don't even like to call them students that often. You know why? When we call them students, we have this perception in the back of our brains already. You say students, one of two things comes to mind. One, it's the perfect child who comes in, sits down, and says, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, I got my homework ready to go. <laughs> and then there's the view that most teachers have when you think of students. Oh. <laughs> they're not students, they're people. They're people. They're going to grow up and they're going to replace us. In fact, our entire job is to create our replacements. Do you realize that? We're creating the next generation of our society. The people who are going to come and replace us. They are people. They have needs. They have, have so great of needs that I can't even begin to tell you the stories. You've all heard them. 
You all know the stories. You all know, the, know the, the stories behind those faces, and yet they still shock us every time. I'm 36 years old, and some of my 15-year-old students come in, have lived more in their life than I have, and probably ever will. We teach people. We have to understand that we actually teach our neighbors. In some cases, very literally, your, na your neighbors right next door to you are your students. And other times, it's former students that come back later on. You know, as a teacher, we don't ever get sick, do we? We don't, we don't get sick very often. A except for one time a year. The second day of vacation. <laughs> second day of vacation, you get sick every year, don't you? Second day, it doesn't matter where you are. You've got a, a trip planned to Rio. You've saved for your entire life. And now you're vomiting. Or I'll spare you the details. <laughs> Second day of vacation in my sixth year of teaching. It was Christmas time, Christmas vacation. Second day of vacation, I get sick. I'll spare you the details. I go to the doctor. Doctor gives me some medication. My wife's driving me home. She says, get that smile off your face. I say, honey, I'm not smiling. My chin was up in my ear. Turns out I was having a facial, facial seizure. I was allergic to the medication, didn't know it. It wasn't the doctor's fault. They didn't do anything wrong. It was the first time they'd ever prescribed that to me. I'd never had it. Next thing I know, I'm on the floor. I'm in a full-blown seizure, and I know my wife is calling 911. That's about all I remember. Until I open my eyes again, seizures settle down, and I look up. Here's Justin standing over the top of me. Justin's a paramedic. Justin graduated two years ago from my high school. Justin's a former student of mine. There are times in your life <laughs> where you will reflect on your effectiveness as an educator <laughs> and whether or not you have done everything in your power to support these children. <laughs> Justin picked me up. He put me on the gurney. He rode in the back of the ambulance with me on the way to the hospital. Now, it wasn't life-threatening. Don't get that impression. But he was there for me in my moment of need. If you go back to the story, I didn't say that Justin was one of my best students. And I probably won't. <laughs> but he's my neighbor. He's who I rely upon. He is our society. That's who and what we teach. Isn't it? So we got to remember as educators, when we're asked to be teacher leaders, when we're asked to get into these roles that fill up our resumes, and we got these nice things that are, are attached to it now, We've got to remember why we teach. We have to remember why we do what we do. We have to stay focused and we have to stay grounded in the things that are most important to us. So people ask me then, okay, so what's your focus? What do you focus on? Well, my focus has changed over the years, I'll admit it. This is my 13th year in education and it has changed drastically, mostly because of two people. So that's my wife, Monica. Our son Andrew and my daughter Michaela. Andrew is now seven, he's in first grade. My daughter is now four and in charge of the entire house. <laughs> you want something done? Don't ask me. Ask Michaela. People say, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. You're worried about your kid's education. I'm not. I'm not worried about my kid's education. I'm the first in my family to go to and graduate from college. My wife went to college. I've got Dora the Explorer Princess Edition, the book, in my bag right now. You know why? Because I Skyped with my daughter last night so I could read her her bedtime story. Mm, good for you. Yeah. Why? Because I know I would get yelled at if I didn't. <laughs> I am not worried about my daughter's education. But you know what I am worried about? Okay. I'm her dad. But isn't she beautiful? <laughs> That's a problem. Somebody's going to want to marry her someday. I don't get to choose who that is. We have to teach every single child in the United States because somebody's going to marry my daughter someday. 
<laughs> I used to think that all I had to do was get Zilla taken care of. If we can just get all the kids in Zilla, everything will be fine. Then I started traveling this year and realized how easy it was to get to South Carolina in a day. <laughs> what if she travels to South Carolina sometimes and, and falls in love? <laughs> then I went to Japan. We have an international crisis, people. We have to teach every single child on the planet. And you know what? Some people marry older, some people marry younger. We got about 40 years. We got to cover, plus or minus 20, okay? We've got to teach every single kid. That's my focus, because I'm worried about not only who my daughter's gonna marry, but I'm worried about who she's gonna live next door to. I'm worried about the neighborhood that she will raise her children in. I'm worried about our future. That's my focus. That's why I do everything that I do. You have to find and hold on to that focus no matter where you go. I will fully admit that there are a lot of opportunities for us to change in education. People say right now, well, you know, National Teacher of the Year, is this really the time that we should be encouraging kids to go into education? Should we really be encouraging you know, our, our high school graduates to go into education? Yes, because now is such an opportunity to cause and affect change. It's huge. We have so many different things that we can work on. It's the alphabet soup game. You've seen this before. From No Child Left Behind to Race to the Top to Common Core State Standards, Next Generation Science Standards, TPEP is what we call it, Teacher Principal Evaluation Portfolio. The one that all of us deeply care about, TERS. Anyone? Teacher Retirement System. <laughs> And then I'm pretty sure that something else was created this morning. Let's check on EdWeek later on ed.gov to figure out what the new acronyms are. That's what the A, B, C, D, E, F on the bottom is for, is whatever new thing is coming our way. You know, I'm not going to tell you how to feel about any one of these programs, but I'll tell you this. You can affect change on every single one of them. Your voice and your opinion matters on each and every one. And we have such an opportunity right now to affect change in each one of these. People want to listen to you. Policymakers, believe it or not, actually want to listen to you. They do, but they're people and they don't know how. Just like you don't know how to approach a policymaker sometimes. Oh, what would I even say to the governor? Oh, what would I even say to the superintendent? They're thinking the same thing. What would I even say to the teachers? I don't know how to engage them. Guys, it's like we're at a middle school dance all over again. <laughs> Just go out there and dance. Be willing to go out and have those conversations and you can affect change. You really can. Just do me a favor. Don't pick sides before you go. <coughs> this is the same thing we tell kids in our classrooms, isn't it? To be effective, you've got to understand both sides of the argument before you make up your mind. So whether you're pro-reform or anti-reform, it's totally okay with me. Just don't pick before you do your research. Make sure and do your research and choose your sides wisely. And you know what? People ask me all the time, okay, so are you a Diane Ravitch fan or are you a Michelle Ree fan? I say, you know what? I actually read them both. <gasps> you what? You read both of them? <laughs> yeah, and you know what? They both sit side by side on my bookshelf and they have yet to burst into flames sitting there. <laughs> because everybody's a little bit right, aren't they? I actually think there's a little bit right in almost every one of the arguments because the best answer that I have found in education, the best answer is, it depends. Because it, doesn't it depend on the situation? Doesn't it depend? How do you grade at school? Well, you'll tell everybody what your policy is, but when that co kid comes in after having that weekend that you know about with the family issues, suddenly your grading scheme depends, doesn't it? That's the best answer in education. So don't pick sides, do what's right. There's a big difference there. Maintain your focus throughout the entire process. Because you know what, I think that it's actually really easy to engage policy make makers. I think it's really easy to affect change. I think we can do it and I think every answer to every single one of our educational issues has already been, been solved. We know how to educate every single type of kid. We just choose not to do it in some cases. And I hate to be blunt like that, but in some cases we just choose not to. Either at a policy level, a state level, a district level, or even a classroom level. So how do we do it? How do we educate all these kids? Simple, lead. People say, teachers come to me and say all the time, oh, I'm not a leader. What? You're a teacher. 
Kindergarten teachers, you got 25 of them. If they wanted to bum rush you at any moment, you're done. <laughs> done. They are fast, they are mean, and they are sticky. <laughs> you already lead 25 people every single day. You are a leader already. Just do what you do in the classroom is leading. It is. Just understand this, the system's not broken. We're not a broken system entirely. Yes, we're like a six cylinder engine only running on five cylinders and we never know which five it is on any given day. We do have some work that needs to be done. I fully agree with that. But I think the answer is already within the system itself. So what are the answers? Well, let's look at a great classroom for a second. I think we can all agree what a great classroom looks like. Great classrooms, I think, start hands on. I don't think there's a really a big debate about that. Whether you're in a science class and you're doing labs, whether you're in an English class and you're, you're really diving into the literature, you're putting on plays, whatever it is, it's hands on. Kids are doing stuff. Put all the weird names to it and whatnot, get rid of all the jargon, kids do stuff. Okay, that's what we gotta do, right? Kids do stuff. That's what it's about. Classrooms are confident. When I say confident, I mean the teacher is confident in themselves and their abilities, and the kids are confident that they can be in a consistent classroom. Now that classroom may be chaotic, and that's the consistency about it. That every day they know when we go into our art teacher's classroom, it is chaos. And it is amazing what comes out of there. You give an art teacher three rolls of duct tape and some empty paper towel holders, and they will create a nuclear weapon. <laughs> It is amazing what they can do, but it's consistent to the kids. They know what to expect, so the kids become confident in themselves and their abilities. Now, side note, I don't like to use just words in presentations. I like to throw pictures in. I couldn't find a great classroom that would give me the release forms, so I had to put in a mediocre one. Uh, at the same time, I, I apologize. That's my classroom back in Zilla. The kids become confident in themselves and their abilities. When the teacher is confident, the kids gain confidence. That's what great classrooms do, right? A great classroom is creative. I used to have a word I, I, that I liked, innovative, until we started using it so much that innovative wasn't innovative anymore. <laughs> but great classrooms are creative. When I started out in, uh, in my school, I literally had a chalkboard. And I was so excited in my second year when I got the white chalk instead of the yellow chalk. <laughs> that was a great day. We now have 28 high-powered computers. I've got a laser cutter, a 3D printer, and we use AutoCAD. That's creative. Why do we do all that stuff? Basically because my degree was in biology. Oh, that's right, because bio and engineering go hand in hand, right? So we had to get a little bit creative. We, had to, we saw a need and we got a creative in how to fill that need. That's what great classrooms do. Great classrooms latch on to opportunities when those opportunities are good for kids, no matter what the subject area is. Great classrooms also understand this, that they're student-led. I've been interviewed so many times, people ask me, so what's your classroom management plan? <laughs> like, I'm in charge. Are you kidding me? I'm not in charge of the classroom. I'm not, because I know this. You get three kids behind you, and you can do anything. You know that, don't you? Convince three kids that it's cool, and suddenly all of your troubles go away. So a classroom is not actually led by a teacher. I believe it's student-led. When the kids gain some power and some authority in your classroom, suddenly you become very powerful and very authoritative. It's amazing, isn't it? That's what great classrooms do. Because isn't this the goal? And I don't actually mean the caps and gowns. What I mean is the smiling faces, kids that are looking at their future and they're excited about what they see. That's the goal, isn't it? So at the end of the day, a great classroom is positive. Bar none. You walk in, everything about the room is positive. Good things are happening, we're talking about it, and we're moving people in the right direction. So here's an idea. Why don't we take a great classroom and do that with all of education? Why don't we just take a great classroom and turn it into a great system? Why don't we just scale it up? It works. And great systems do this. Great systems value experience. Just like you gain hands-on experience in a great classroom, great systems value experience. And when I say value experience, I mean value those that have come before us and have the years of experience in 
to know when a movement is really a movement or just a change of letters. And they also value, value the experience that comes along with people that actually know how to use these things. There are so many new educators now that understand social media way better than I do. Way better than I do. And that's experience that we need to value. We value all types of experience in a great system. Great systems value support too, don't they? But you know, this is a two-way street. I gotta be honest with you. Yes, I need my administrator to support me. Totally, 100% agree with that. But when my administrator got his degree, he did not become instantly smart. They did not, woo, you have all the answers. You are now a principal. And if you have even more answers than that, now you're a superintendent, good job. It doesn't work that way, does it? Just like I needed those three kids in my classroom to get behind me, your principals need three teachers to get behind him or her. We need to support our administration just as much as we need the support back. It is a two-way street, just like in the classroom. Great systems are also flexible. How do you think it went when I went to the school board and said, um, so I got this idea, I'm 23 years old, never done anything like this before, I wanna take 15 kids into bear infested woods 26 miles away from a road. Cool? Yeah, no. But great administrators, great systems do something else with the no. They say no but. They say no but if you do this, 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 and this, then you can do it. That's what great leadership does. Great leadership never says no, period. Great leadership says no, comma, but if you do this, this, and this. Now there's been some ideas I've had where the no but was no but if you raise $10 million, you can do it. And I said, $10 million, really? And they're like, well, list it out. And I'm like, oh, okay, snap. That is $10 million. All right, cool. <laughs> but you know, we need that. We need to know why, don't we? We need to know why it's a no. And we need to know where the hurdle is so that we can overcome it. Sometimes you will be shocked at what people can actually do when you give them the opportunity. Man, it sounds like a classroom, doesn't it? Aren't we shocked sometimes when we give our students the opportunity to achieve? Same thing happens in great systems. Great systems are teacher-driven. Just as a classroom is not in the control of the teacher, a great school is not in control of the, by the principal. It's driven by the teachers. The teachers actually have control so that the principal gains even more than that. That's what a great system does. What do you do as a teacher leader to support your principal, get some drive from that person to move your school forward? That's what you gotta think about. You gotta think, by the end of the day, what you really wanna get to is the point where your system is showcasing the good things that are happening. Now I gotta tell you, South Carolina, you guys got it figured out. Number one, you have way more festivals than any other state I have ever heard of. We got like one. <laughs> Seriously, it's amazing. Absolutely, I don't even know what they all are, so um, you have to explain this later, because there was a few in there, I was like, what? But you're doing this right here. You know how few states this happens in? It's actually a travesty. You need to share this message. You need to share the showcasing that is happening here with other states. Don't think I'm not stealing this idea and taking it back to Washington, because I am. Yeah. We have to showcase. We have to be willing to brag about ourselves. You know, when I was named District Teacher of the Year, the only reason why I was finally named is because my superintendent went behind my back. You see, in our school, the way it works is the superintendent and the president of the local association take nominations, and then the two of them decide on who the teacher of the year is. Well, who's that guy? Oh, that was me for five years in a row. And so I took my name out of the hat every single time. And then it came time two years ago to name somebody, and I kept emailing my superintendent, and he wouldn't return any of my emails. Jerk. <laughs> wouldn't it, he's not. But he wouldn't reply to any of them. And then suddenly he goes on the last day, I say, we have to pick somebody, this is tonight. And he writes back, Charbonneau, you idiot, it's you. And I said, what? He says, I went behind your back and I've got a signed petition by all the teachers in our district that it's you. I'm like, oh, I was embarrassed by it. I didn't want it. Why? Because we're not bred for that, are we? As teachers, we're not used to pointing the fingers back at us. We have to be willing to let the fingers point back. Because we don't showcase our work, we showcase our students' work. We showcase the work of our districts. We showcase the work of our state and of our country. And if we're not willing to step up, who's gonna be? So those name tags you guys got out there, you wear those as a badge of honor and you showcase. Because by the end of the day, yeah. 
By the end of the day, if you don't, nobody else will. And you know what? We turn great classrooms into great systems, and suddenly the work can get done and we can affect change on a huge national level. Great systems are great classrooms, but they only work if we showcase in the end. So what do we teach? By the time you go through all the rest of this stuff, you still have that question lingering over the top of you, don't you? You still have that question of, okay, what do I answer when somebody asks me, what do I teach? I think the answer needs a little bit of explanation. I think what you say to somebody is, you know, we teach to students of absolutely all backgrounds. We teach to students of all backgrounds, of all abilities to be successful, no matter the circumstances. That's what we teach, but it's still the wrong question. What we teach is nowhere near as important as why we do it. As you go out and you advocate for your students, and that advocacy level can be on so many different ways. It can be still in your schools, it can be at a district level, it can be at parent meetings, it can be at the Capitol. Wherever that advocacy is, you have to include the why. Because the why is so incredibly important. So why do we teach? We teach to give hope. We teach so that our kids can hope in themselves and their future. And so that I can have hope in what my daughter's life is going to turn out as. That's why we teach. We're teaching for the new us. We're teaching for our replacements. We're teaching for our new society. It doesn't take Superman to do the job. It doesn't take Wonder Woman to do the job. All it takes is teachers. Because underneath, we all have that ability. Underneath, we all have exactly what we need. Don't we? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Thank you so very much for letting me be here tonight. It is such an honor to be here. And I have to say, I have never worn a South Carolina Superman, super teacher shirt before. And it is dang pretty. So thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you. Stay right here, stay right here. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Awesome. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. <laughs> that is also the only time I have ever unbuttoned in front of an audience. <laughs> Excuse me while I put myself back together here. We kept telling that this isn't the first time that we've seen this happen before. <laughs> but I think that um, you would agree with me in seconding Amy's comments that we are very fortunate as a state and a nation to have Jeff Charbonneau representing our voice and our profession. The things that he says are just so touching. And I don't know if, if you guys feel this way, but whenever I meet with him and whenever I talk with him and hear him speak, I'm just really touched by the genuineness that comes out of you. You know, he could be a South Carolina boy, except he doesn't like grits. But the fact that at the center of everything he does is the success of his students. That is common across South Carolina. Mm -hmm. As I've traveled this year, I've found that to be so true. Despite the change in the landscape, despite the change in the schools, the one thing that is so true is that what you do, you do because you are a source of hope for the students that you teach. Jeff, thank you, thank you. for representing us. And we have a little bit of South Carolina for you to take back awesome. with you. Awesome. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.